Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Can we start by uh, talking about the tax? Should mining companies pay more tax? Well, I don't think the case has been made that they should pay a larger percentage of their profits in tax. Uh, that, I don't think that case has been made compellingly by the government. Of course, uh, like any business, mining companies pay more tax when they make more profits. So as they're during a mining boom, they will pay more tax. And of course, they, they will uh, get higher revenues for their um, product. Uh, so they'll be paying more royalties, most royalties being based on gross revenue. If there were to be a tax on so-called super profits, is the RSBT the correct way to go? Well, I, I think you, you can, you're tying up two things. Firstly, the RSPT is not a tax on super profits, as you know. Uh, the idea that a return over six percent, a return over six percent is a super profit, is really Orwellian. It's absurd. The reason for the six percent figure, or in fact the the ten year Commonwealth government bond rate, is because, as you know, of this um, this sort of um, theoretical fiction that because there is under the proposed RSPT an effective put to the Commonwealth of 40% of the unrecovered losses of a project at the end, at the time the project is closed down. Therefore, so the theory goes, the cost of capital as to 40% of the project should be the risk-free rate, the long-term risk-free rate, i.e. the 10-year Commonwealth Government bond rate. Now, the problem with that, um, as I think you've said publicly, and I've certainly said the same thing, is that it is a it is a fantasy. Um, the the markets do not value that Commonwealth put at all. Uh, it doesn't um, provide any um, at financial advantage to those seeking to finance mining projects. And so what it what it represents, therefore, is a uh, a, a hurdle rate that, if it's designed to define super profits um, or rent, economic rent, which is probably a better way to describe it, uh, it is ju just simply way too low. Nobody would undertake a mining project if the return was going to be equivalent to the 10-year Commonwealth Government bond rate. So if the RSPT were introduced as proposed without a major amendment, what would the implications for the industry be? Well, it's, it's very negative for the industry. Uh, firstly, because it results in a substantially larger share of the profit pool of the industry being appropriated by government. So, you know, you can, you can have an argument, a theoretical argument, about whether you are better off uh, raising royalties on the basis of volume or on the basis of uh, revenue as at the, the mine head or on the basis of profits, uh, however defined. You can have that argument. But at the end of the day, what is going to be of most significance to mining companies and the people that invest in them is how much of the profit of that mining project is going to accrue to the shareholders and the investors, therefore, as opposed to the government, uh, which is raising, taking its share in form of taxes of one kind or another. So this is a very substantial increase in, in taxation of the mining sector. So it reduces the uh, attractiveness of mining projects in Australia. It also makes Australian the, the taxation regime for Australian mining the highest in the world. Um, the, the, I've seen, we've all seen calculations done of the relative, uh, the comparative taxation regimes in other countries. Uh, you know, for example, Brazil was a good example on, on iron ore. The, the tax, Australia's uh, T total tax take for a mining project, an iron ore project, will be dramatically higher than it is, for example, in Brazil, where, of course, we are, which is a direct competitor. So it's, a, it, look, it, 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 it's difficult to describe this tax to say anything good about it because it is not only bad for the mining industry in the sense that it reduces the returns to the mining industry, but the way the government has gone about it has really undermined our reputation as being a country with a high degree of fiscal stability. So the, you know, the policy on the run, the confusion, the uncertainty, all of that does enormous damage uh, to our reputation as a safe and stable place to invest. Malcolm, I want to take you into carbon. Um, uh, 
there's now a lot more debate about um, whether carbon is warming the world. Um, what's your view about the situation? Robert, the, my view has, has been that we should, as a matter of prudence, give the planet the benefit of the doubt. There is a very, very high level of, uh, of um, what do you say, consensus among scientists around the world that uh, human beings are causing global warming by the increased emission of uh, greenhouse gases, and, you know, principally carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, and uh, that we should, as a matter of prudence, um, in Rupert Murdoch's words, give the planet the benefit of, of the doubt and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I, I, you know, that is, I think, the prudent approach, and it's the approach that pretty much every government in the world is... Uh, has uh, so, you know has agreed to for quite some years. Would your view and say Bob Brown's view on on that on that carbon issue be be similar? Well, I, I don't. I'm happy to tell you what my view is, but I don't know what Bob Brown's view is on uh, on carbon. You'd have to ask him. Brown wants a the, the Greens want a carbon tax um, instead of a, an emissions trading scheme. Uh, leaving aside the rate of the carbon tax. Do you think that in the light of the problems we've had with emissions trading schemes, um, it would be better to go for a carbon tax? Well, I certainly think that if you want to cost effectively reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, you need to have a market-based mechanism which puts a price on carbon. Uh, the, the two best ways to do that are either through a carbon tax, um, which, has the, which makes the price of carbon certain, but of course does not give you any degree of certainty as to what the level of emissions will be. Uh, the alternative, which is what we, were, we had as our policy when we were in government and was the Rudd government's policy until recently, was to have an emissions trading scheme where you set a cap on emissions, uh, would-be emitters, industry have to buy permits and competition for those permits uh, sets the price and uh, so you have a market, the market setting the price for carbon. Most people, and most economists uh, I should say, uh, prefer the emissions trading scheme approach to the carbon tax approach but both of them have merit um, and certainly you, if you're going to get a cost effective reduction in CO2 emissions you really do need to let the market sort it out and by putting a price on the um, currently untaxed negative externality, that is to say, the emission of carbon dioxide. Your view is very different, isn't it, to the uh, current coalition view? Well, I, well <laughs> the, the coalition uh, is no longer supporting an emissions trading scheme but it certainly supports action to reduce CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions and it has a direct action policy uh, which would involve the government um, using its funds, taxpayers' money, to buy sufficient offsets, principally from the agricultural sector, um, to offset Australia's emissions to an extent that would enable us to meet the 2020 target uh, of um, being 95% of uh, 2000 level emissions, which is quite a, which is a, which means roughly reducing our emissions from business as usual by 2020 by uh, at least 140 million tonnes. Malcolm, the, the broad view of the, the Copenhagen talks were that they were a failure. Do you share that view or do you have a different perspective on it? Well, I, I, I think. I, don't, I think failure is too um, strong a word. I think they certainly did not achieve everything that you know, the most optimistic um, people expected. But you, you have seen, uh, for, you know, for example, for the first time, uh, global agreement on uh, policies to keep temperatures to temperature increases, temp the temperature increase to no more than 2%, to 2 degrees, I should say. Um, and you've seen commitments from most countries, uh, certainly all the major economies, um, to take action to either reduce their emissions in absolute terms or reduce their emissions intensity. And uh, as um, Warwick McKibben pointed out 
recently, those commitments uh, from China, from India, you know, from the US, uh, amount to uh, very substantial uh, decreases in emissions from business as usual levels, which is probably the best, um, you know, the best benchmark that you can use across economies. So, so the answer is, um, it, it's a, it, it, in a sense, assessing Copenhagen, I think, is a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty proposition. Uh, certainly the glass is half full, but from the point of view of somebody who wanted a full glass, it is also half empty.